Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy today. We thank you, Father, especially for your Sabbath day. Time that you have given us, Lord, to disconnect from this world and to fully focus on you. And we thank you, Father, because you have honored this day and you have sanctified it and you have hallowed it. And it is the day that you delight to be with your people. And so we are here filled with joy and gladness because we know that you are here with us. <clears throat> Father, as we start this morning's message, we pray that your spirit may go through in and out between the pews and touch our hearts and our minds. Open our understanding, Lord, and help us to see your vision for us. Help us to understand your intents, your desires, your hopes, your dreams concerning us, your people. And we pray, Father, that at the end of the day we may see a glimpse of heaven and the love of Jesus. I pray that you may speak through me today. Touch my heart and my mind. Hide me behind your cross. Help me to decrease, Lord, so that you and only you may increase. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of our presentation today is The Gospel in Shoes. I don't believe I need this. So I'm just going to put it right here. It's not working. We're not familiar with it. All right. The Gospel in Shoes, that is our presentation. That is the title of our presentation this morning. Uh, actually, that's not the complete title. The complete title is The Gospel in Shoes, God's Masterpiece. The Gospel in Shoes, God's Masterpiece. I want to start with this question. What is a masterpiece? Who knows? What is a masterpiece? Work of art. A work of art, yes. All right. Any other ideas? A, ma a masterpiece. If something's called a masterpiece, yes? It's a completed piece, but it's like your greatest piece of work. Your greatest piece of work, right? Okay, so both of those answers are correct. When something attains to the level of being called a masterpiece, that is a work of outstanding skill and artistry. Mm -hmm. Right? A work of outstanding skill and artistry and workmanship. And workmanship. Now, for those of you who are into the world of art, paintings, right? Uh, uh, what is the most famous painting that we know of? The Mona Lisa, right? See, that was very easy. How about the second most famous? The Lord's Supper, yes? That is it, right? So first, the most famous is the Mona Lisa, right? By one Leonardo da Vinci. And the second one is also by the same guy. It's called the Lord's Supper. How about the third? I want to see if we can do this. Is this Steve No. What? It's a work of art that has a mouth like this. That's a fourth. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is it the blue painting with the swirls? Is it by um, Starry Night? Starry Night. Is it Starry Night? Not quite. I'm going to help you out. It's the creation of Adam by Ma Michelangelo. Wow. Yeah. You know that one? Yeah. Maybe you think I read some of Yeah, yeah. So you have those three paintings that are very well known in the world. Now, in the world, in the world of art, those are called masterpieces, right? I mean, that's the whole reason why they're so good. That's what. That's the whole reason why that you and I know them, right? Because they're masterpieces. Those who put them together put in a lot of work. What is the whole point of putting in all that work into a piece of family? Right? What's the whole point? To show somebody, right? Yeah, what else? <laughs> to remember? Okay. To express oneself, right? To express thoughts. So, we'd be correct then to say that the artist, the artist has some kind of thought of, or an idea that he wants to communicate through his work. Right? 
right? That's the whole point of whatever art form that you do. You have this idea, you have this thought that you would like to communicate to your audience. And so we see the Mona Lisa there uh, that has a message, all right? Now, I, I, I'm, I'm going to meet. I have no, I don't have a bone of part in my body. Whenever I look at Mona Lisa, it's just... Just want to listen, you know. <laughs> but there are those who look at the thing and they say, wow, this is, a, this is an icon of, of, of the Renaissance, right? Or oh, they will look at the thing and then they will see, you know, it would elicit, elicit emotions out of them, right? So whoever looks upon that thing can have a different reaction. Now, I did a little bit of poking around. Like I said, I'm not really be into the whole art thing, but I wanted to see really how popular is the Mona Lisa. How popular is it, really? is it really? And it turns out that every year the Mona Lisa enjoys about 6 million views. Every year. About 6 million views. 6 million people want to go and gaze upon this work of Leonardo. And quite frankly, when they go, they, they gaze and they marvel. Right? They say, wow, this is awesome. This is wonderful work. This is excellent work. So, artists like Leonardo, uh, Michelangelo, Picasso, if you really look at their craft, if you start to study their craft, they put years and years and years of work into this one single piece of art. They put literally their souls and their whole livelihood into this thing. And like we already said, they have this idea that, that they want you to kind of glean from just looking upon this thing. Now, if you have the means to fly to, 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 to France or wherever, you know, and you go into one of those museums and you look upon one of those pieces of art, their original intention that you will get out of that room with an idea that they wish to communicate to you. Now, I want to say this. As talented and as skilled and as prolific and as successful all as all of these men were, they are, their work is only of human origin. That's right. Amen. Did you get that? Amen. As skillful and as good and as successful as all of these men were and women, their work is only of a human origin. And the only influence that you get from looking upon their work and studying their work and spending time looking at their work can only influence you in the ways of human culture and ideas. Right. Human culture and ideas. Now, we, we're not going to talk. We're, gonna, we're not going to spend the whole afternoon talking about you know the the, 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 the masterpieces of art and all those things. We want to talk about God's masterpiece. Amen. Amen. Because I mean, God created these individuals, right? And they're exercising their genius and they're producing all those things of, of marvelous skill and, and workmanship. But if the product can do that, how about the producer? Mm. Amen. So that's what we want to spend time this afternoon kind of looking upon and learning what does it mean to be God's masterpiece. Our scripture this morning has been read to you. It's found in the New Testament book of Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 4, and no doubt many of you are familiar with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. When you get there, would you say amen? amen. Uh, this, is, this is the Apostle Paul. I want, I want you to capture this picture. This is the Apostle Paul addressing the church in Corinth. And to kind of give you a, a background understanding, kind of uh, draw up the context here. Uh, uh, the church in Corinth was the messiest church in the New Testament. 
They had all kinds of stuff happening in the church. Uh, uh, in fact, the, those two big letters, uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, is basically Paul trying to address all of these issues that were happening in the church. And in the letter of 1 Corinthians, basically Paul is, is getting warmed up, right? He's getting warmed up. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, 3, he's getting warmed up. Because such issues were, you know, they had divisions in the church. You know, some would say, well, I am of Apollos. Some, I am of Paul. Some of such, such a person. And, and, you know, they had all kinds of craziness happening. Quarrels in the church. They had worldliness in the church. Folks were suing each other upside down, right? You step on my toe, I'm taking you to court. Ridiculous things were happening in the church of Corinth. And so Paul starts to pen these two big letters and basically, he's slapping them upside the head a little bit. He said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And we, we get here to, to chapter 4, verse 9. Paul says, for I think that God has displayed us, the apostles last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. There are two key words that I want you to put in your pocket this morning. Two key words. Spectacle and display. Those are my words. We're going to keep dropping those words all throughout the afternoon. So take those two words, put put them in your pocket. We're going to revisit them all throughout this presentation. The context, of course, being that Corinth is messed up. I mean, it has all these things. Paul starts to write this letter to the Corinthians and say, hey, what are you doing? What a get your stuff together. <coughs> Don't you know that the world is watching? And not only the world, what else is it? Who else is watching? Angels. 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 He says we have been put on display. Right? We are a spectacle in front of angels and men. Now, let me ask you, what does what is a spectacle? What is a spectacle? If something is a spectacle, what is it? It's standing out, right? Spectacular, right? It, it, it shows out, right? It catches attention. It attracts attention. That is a spectacle. And he says not only are we spectacles, but we also have been put on display for everyone to see. And friends, if something is put on display, it has been put maybe on a pedestal somewhere. That's right. Right? Mm-hmm. In a very strategic place where whoever wants to look at it and examine it and turn it upside down and around and, and really get into it can do so. All right. Go ahead. I want you to catch the drift here. Right? Paul has a point. He has uh, this idea that as they live out there, right? As the church in Corinth, as they were, you know, kind of growing in those times, they were a spectacle before man and before angels. And that word theater, right there, that word theater, is also taken from the word, from the Greek word theatron. Or actually, the word spectacle is taken from the Greek word theatron, which means a theater. Right? A theater is a place where you go and view something. Right? Okay, so he says, hey, we are basically in this great big theater and we are on display. I want you to I want you to think about this. The closest here is the Lucas Oil Stadium, right? Let's say you go and stand right in the dead center of that thing, right? Imagine with me your house. Your house is at the very center of that thing, right? Or your job is at the center of that thing. Whatever you do is at the center of the Lucas Oil Stadium, and you have all these people just fill, filling out the place, and they are looking intently into every single thing that you do. Every single thing that you do. So now, Paul is suggesting 
that this messy church, with all this craziness going on, with all this quarrels going on, this church is on display. Not only men, but also angels have the opportunity to look and, and, and examine, turn it upside down, look at it, and say, okay, what really is going on in the church of Corinth? The rest of the letter then uh, in Corinth is basically Paul just slapping them upside the, uh, the head a little and saying, wake up! You are on what everyone is. You are on display. Now, you can then ask the question, well, why? Right? Why are you on display? Why are they on display? Why are we on display. We, we, we call ourselves Christians, don't we? Amen. Right? We call ourselves Christians. And when, when did this body of believers begin being called Christians? Antioch. Right? Antioch. In the book of Acts. It says that the, in Antioch, the, uh, the apostles were first called Christians. So you can say, well, Paul was talking about the apostles of the time, right? He, he did say we apostles, right, have been made as men condemned to death. Well, who are the apostles today? Amen. That's right. So you are on this hmm. Well, we ask and say, well, why? What's the, what's the point? Why are we on this way? Uh, go with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. And you're right there. Go from Galatians, you go to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. This is the same Paul who was writing now to a different church in Ephesus, right? And we want to consider chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, starting from verse 1. Paul says, and remember, we wanted to answer the question, why are we on this why are we on this way? What's the whole point here? Paul says, verse 1, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. As I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of man, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit uh, to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of, uh, of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of His power. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, hey, I have received some revelation from the Spirit of God. I have received a revelation of a mystery that had never been revealed to anyone up until God revealed it through His Holy Spirit to His apostles. Right? So basically, what Paul is trying to do here to the church in, uh, in Ephesus, he is trying to capture their attention. He's saying, hey, literally, hey, I'm not coming to you on my behalf. This is something that the Spirit of God has revealed to me, and it is for you. Right? He did say that. He said, the, the Spirit of God has revealed this to me for your sake. And it is a mystery that has never been revealed after this time. And you ask, well, well, well pray tell, folks, what is the mystery? What is it? Wouldn't you want to know? Well, I already read it. Did you catch it? Verse 6. What is this mystery? Right? Verse 6 says that the Gentiles should be what? Fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through what? Through the gospel. Amen. So this was a mystery, right? And the whole mystery was this that the Gentiles were also supposed to be part of the body of Christ. 
through the preaching of the gospel. Now you ask me, you say, well, 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 that is not new information, brother. We know that. Well, we do now. <laughs> because Paul already said it, right? But I want you to think back in the days of Paul. What was happening there, if you were, now, what is a Gentile? A Gentile was, per, was basically anyone who was not of the lineage of Abraham. <clears throat> All right? So if you didn't have Abraham as your forefather or as your ancestor, you did not count. You were called a Gentile. Right. And so the Holy Spirit comes to Paul and he says, hey, hey, this whole thing that you guys have going on for you Jews doesn't quite capture the picture that God has. Amen. It doesn't quite do justice. Because not only the Jews are to be the part of the body of Christ, but also the Gentiles. Amen. Now, I want you to think about this, because this is the whole reason why Jesus was this new radical rabbi that nobody really could quite understand. Right? He would come up there on the, on the Mount of Olives, right? And he would say, hey, you, you have heard it being said, but I say this. <laughs> and he would literally go against the whole fabric of Judaism. Why? Because he was trying to get them to turn their minds from those cultural things that they had come up with. He was trying to refocus them to the picture that God had when he called Abraham. And we will go back to that, by the way. And you will see that what the promise that God gave Abraham was very clear. It was very hard to misunderstand. Right? And we will find out as we go, if you study the book of Leviticus, the, the, uh, the laws that Moses gave them, one particular law uh, especially was that thou shalt surely rebuke your neighbor. And thou shalt not bear sin because of him. This was in the last and last week, I think. Right? Thou shalt surely not bear sin because of your neighbor. And so the Jews would look at it and say, wow, this is Gentile. I don't want anything to do with them. Alright? And so that evolved to this Judaic-centric gospel that say, hey, if you are a Jew and you're rich, you're good. Mm. <laughs> Basically, you have to be a wealthy, healthy Jew to count. Right? Yeah. Worse still, if you were if you were not if you're not a grandchild of Abraham, there was nothing for you. And so Paul steps on the scene. He said, "Hey, the Holy Spirit has revealed this thing to me. This is a mystery that has never been revealed to the sons of men up to this time. And what is the mystery, Paul? Here is the mystery that the Gentiles, God wants them in the house of faith." Remember the question that we asked, why is the church of Corinth on display, right? So basically, Paul is getting to the point, all right? He's getting to the point. All right, so we start with verse 7. Verse 8, Paul says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace, talking about this mystery, this gospel, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ. Verse 9, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. And I want you to pay a very close attention to, to verse 10. Verse 10 says, to the intent. Alright, we get into the reason now. The reason why the church is on display, he says, to the intent. Another word for that is for the purpose of. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Okay. Ha. Did you catch that? What is the purpose? What is the purpose? That was that through the church, by beholding the church, not only men and angels, but the principalities and powers in heavenly places can come to understand something about the character of God that they would otherwise not have access to. I mean, is that powerful or what? And we ask, well, why is the church on display? Why are we being put on the limelight? 
Why were you being put in the front seat? The whole reason why the church is on display, the whole reason why you are on display is that the heavenly uh, angels, the principalities, and the powers in heavenly places can look into your life and learn something about the character of God that they otherwise would not understand. Amen. Friends, that is the ultimate compliment to be a Christian. That is the ultimate compliment to be a Christian. Verse 10 says, to intent that now the manifold wisdom of God. That is the very thing that God wishes that it would be made plainer to the principalities and the powers through the church. The manifold wisdom of God. This is Paul. This is Paul. Now, well, you say, well, hey, don't the angels already know the wisdom of God? Don't the principalities and the powers in these heavenly places, don't they already know the manifold wisdom of God? We're going there. Alright, so, the angels know that God is love. Right? They live with him in heaven. They see him every day. Well, they really don't have days there. Right? They see him. <laughs> they see him. Right? They live in this atmosphere of heaven that is pure love. Because God is love. Amen. The angels know that God is holy. You read the book of Revelation. They go and they bow down to the throne of God and they cry, Holy. 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 They know that God is holy. They do not question the righteousness of God. Right. They don't question that. But friends, what has been called into question concerning God is whether or not God is a just God. That is the only thing that has been questioned about the character of God is whether or not he is a just God. Satan's whole premise, when he rebelled in heaven, I mean, his whole thing was that God didn't love them. No. Right? No. His whole thing was that God wasn't holy. He knew that God is holy. His whole thing wasn't that God isn't righteous. He knew that God was righteous. But his whole thing in heaven was that the laws of God are not saved. Right. He called into question the very justness of God. He called into question the judgment of God. Now, the reason why then the church now has to reveal to the principalities and the powers the manifold wisdom of God is that wisdom and judgment go together. Wisdom and judgment are synonymous. Well, how do we know this? How do we know this? Go with me in your Bible. The book of 1 Kings. We will consider a very familiar text. Book of 1 Kings, chapter 3. This is very familiar to you. This is the story of King Solomon. Right? King Solomon is known as the wisest man, the wisest king to ever live. Up to this day, no one is wiser than King Solomon. Right. I don't care if you can bring Aristotle, you can, you can bring Sir Isaac Newton, none of those guys can stack up to King Solomon. Amen. He was the wisest man to ever live. Now, how did he get his wisdom? Right? That's what we're looking at right here. Reading from verse 1, now Solomon made a treaty with, the, with Pharaoh, with Pharaoh king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter when he brought her to the city of David. Chapter? Oh, chapter 3, sorry. Chapter 3. Actually, we're just going to cut to the chase here. Alright, start, start verse 3. And Solomon loved the Lord. We, we all know the story. Walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. Verse 4, now the king went to Gideon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand great offerings on that altar. 
a Gideon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this greatness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, instead of my father David. But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, I have not asked, and have not asked for long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your word. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before uh, before you, nor, nor shall any like you arise after you. What just happened here? Solomon is asleep, right? He's at Gideon. He just offered all the sacrifice. He goes to sleep. God shows up in the dream. God says, hey, ask, what shall I do for you? Now, 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 if God had asked me what I wanted of God, look here, okay? That list would have been like, I want this and this and this and this, everything in the world, right? But what pleased the Lord was that he did not ask for his own self-gratification. He had the best intents at heart for the people of God. And so he asked for an understanding heart. And God was ready to, to give him the desires of his heart. And he wakes up in the morning, right? He says, man, I was dreaming. All right? I mean, I, 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 I can almost imagine. He wakes up in the morning, he's like, that was just a dream, right? You know, and then he just goes on with his day, right? In fact, where is that? 15, right? Yes. Verse 15 says, Then Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been a dream. And then he came to Jerusalem, back to just the way things used to be, and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, offered a burnt sacrifice, sacrifice and offered peace offerings. That was his thing. Remember, he was in Gideon to do the same thing. So he was not out of the ordinary, right, for King Solomon to offer sacrifices. He wakes up, it had been just a dream. He says, man, all right, well, I guess he was a nice dream. Back to where things used to be. But watch this. God answered his prayer. He answered his request. He gets back to Jerusalem, and almost immediately, almost immediately, his wisdom is tested. Amen. Right? Yeah. Almost immediately, his wisdom is tested. And in fact, how was his wisdom tested? <coughs> By how he would make a what? Judgment. A judgment or a decision. You know the story. Two women come. One has killed their baby, right? And, you know, they're arguing over the son. You know, they say, well, this is mine, this is mine. But the king comes and says, hey, you know what? Both of you are saying the son is yours. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. So the nation just look at what he's going to do. Right? They're at their wit's end right now. They don't know what to do. The king comes like, give me a sword. And I can say, what? What is he going to do with the sword? He's like, give me a sword. They give him. He said, bring the kid. We're just going to cut right in the center. You have half, and you have the other half. And no story. And of course, we know the story. The one woman who was the true mother cried from a heart, from a mother's heart, said, no, don't kill, don't kill the child. She can have it. Right? And from there, the wisdom of Solomon was displayed to the whole nation. And so it brings us back to the point, friends, that wisdom and judgment go together. That is why you and I, being on display, the principalities and the powers in heavenly places have to understand by looking into your life the manifold wisdom of God. 
Which is his judgment. Does it make sense, yes or no? Praise the Lord. And so Paul here is saying, hey, here's the mystery. Mystery solved. Gentiles, God wants them in the house. There's no more Jew nor Gentile, right? That's a straight Pauline statement, right? There's no more Jew nor Gentile. All are the same in the eyes of God. And Paul is actually not the only one who, for some reason, believe that angels are somehow concerned. Angels are somehow interested in the things that happen on earth. The Apostle Peter says the same thing, right? Go with me in your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, we want to consider verse 10. And the context here is the heavenly inheritance. The context here is concerning your salvation, my salvation. How is it that sinful beings have a way and access to salvation? Right? Starting from verse 10. Of this salvation, Peter says, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Who promised out of the grace that would come to you, searching what and what manner of time the Spirit of Christ would say in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Verse 12. To them it was revealed uh, that not to themselves, but to us, that were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by his Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Watch this. Things which what? Angels desire to look into. The same idea that somehow angels in heaven are interested in the things that are happening with the child, with the children of God. So this, you can find all of this all throughout Scripture. The gospel of grace and of righteousness by faith of Jesus is a mystery not only to the world, but also to angels and principalities and powers. Angels long, Peter say, they long and they desire to look into this thing. And by beholding the church, by beholding you, they are supposed to understand those things. Oh my goodness. And what is the eternal purpose of God? The eternal purpose of God that, that God accomplished in Christ was that God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling not only just the Jews, amen, not only just Christians, but reconciling what? The world, the world to himself. Yes. That was the eternal purpose of God. Now, we want to go back to Corinth. Right? That messy church that we started from? Yeah. Corinth. We want to go back to Corinth. Paul is addressing the Corinthians. He, uh, this, Remember now, the Corinthians now were, you know, they, they were just a mixture. There were some Jews there. There were some Gentiles as well. These Gentiles now turned believers. Right? Because of the gospel. He said, hey, watch your conduct. Watch how you live your life. Because there is a lot that hangs on the balance. Now, have we beat this horse sufficiently? <laughs> right? That the angels are watching. Yeah? Mm -hmm. right. And that the principalities and powers in heavenly places, when they look at you, they should understand something about the manifold wisdom of God. Alright. Alright. How about men? How about your fellow men? What are they supposed to understand when they look at you? Mm -hmm. I want to ask you a question. Between God and the world, who is interested in the other more than the other? That is to say, is God more interested in the world, or is the world more interested in God? 
God is more interested in the world. Amen. Right? Amen. That is the whole purpose of the gospel. Yeah. I want to tell you this. That I go to IUPUI, I right? To again. And uh, I talk to people. You know, there's this spot on campus that if you stand there, they know you're a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you stand there, they know you're a Christian. Okay? So sometimes during my free time, I stand there, especially in the, uh, in the summer. I used to do this a lot in the summer. I just want to stand there. I have my army shirt on. And so I'm in the Lord's army. Big, bold letters army. Right? You know, I'll stand there. Right? And this one curious fellow would walk up. Walk up to me and say, yeah, so you're a Christian, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, you know. And he just blows up up to the other side and tells me how God is so horrible. And start to level out all these ideas and his feelings that he has about God. When this started happening, friends, I will always try to, to, to you know, to, to be like, no, 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 no. But I understand. I finally learned that that really doesn't work. You know? <laughs> what you do is you let them speak. Let them say it. Let them get out what is in their heart. Then. And as I started to do that, friends, I started to realize and to learn that the reason why a lot of people are alienated from God, a, the reason why a lot of people do not like God is because that they have a skewed picture of who God is. It has nothing to do with whether or not God loves them. God loves them. Right? It has nothing to do with whether or not God is a merciful God. God is a merciful God. But the the thing is that they have a skewed picture of who God is. Mm -hmm. And because of that, a lot of young people are outside of the church. Because when they look at God, they look at God as, as, as this big tyrant. Right? Mm -hmm. This big God who is just ready to pounce on them the moment they do something wrong. Right? Yeah. And so the desire of God, the burden of God is that the world would learn the true character of God. That is God's burden. Amen. Is that the people of the world would really understand who He is. Oh. To further appreciate this, uh, this idea that God has always been interested in the world, understanding who He really is. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 12. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Genesis chapter 12. For those army people, what is Genesis chapter 12 about? Go. Abraham. There you go. Well, she just came from army. I should have excluded you. <laughs> See, army has this thing that you memorize the, the themes of the book of Genesis. Each, each book you memorize a theme and the whole idea that you memorize the whole Bible. It works. It works. In fact, Using that very thing, this is how I was able to come upon this, right? So, Genesis chapter 12, right? God here calls who? Abraham. Abraham, right? And we know that Abraham is the father of Israel, right? What is Genesis chapter 11 about? Yeah, you know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Genesis chapter 11 is about the Tower of Babel, right? What happened? What happened in Babel? At the Tower of Babel, right? This is post-flood, right? Post-flood, the, 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 the descendants of Noah, they come to the plains. The Bible says they, they were moving eastward, and they came to the city of the plains, and they got together. They all spoke the same language. Okay? They all spoke the same language, and they say, hey, let us build us a city that will reach up into the heavens. Mm -hmm. Now, Sister White comments on this. She says, basically, this whole <laughs> unity that they had was a rebellion against God. Absolutely. Because the picture that they had of God was like, he's this God who's trying to wipe them out. They were, I mean, the flood was just a few generations ago, right? So they had this picture that God was out to get them. And so they build this tower, because God comes up, he confuses the language, I speak the better, you speak English. He came from there. <laughs> All right? And so we move from 11, we go to 12. 12, 
God calls this man Abraham, and he tells him, he gives him a promise. What was that promise? Through you, all the families of what? The world will be blessed. This is the promise that the Jews missed out. They misunderstood. God saved the families of the world, not the families of the Jews. They missed the point. And so, we understand that chapter 11, there is this problem. God realizes that he needs to correct the idea that the people have about him. And who does he go to? Abraham. Amen. He says, Abraham, you will father this great big nation, and through this nation, through the people of Israel, I want the world to know who I am. Amen. And so the Israelites were on display as well. As they moved through the, uh, through, through the ancient world there, they were on display. And I want you, further understand, I want you to understand further uh, God's intent for the Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy. We'll be closing here shortly. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4. And this is Moses. Now we move from uh, Abraham. Now we're in Moses. Book of uh, Deuteronomy. Chapter 4, starting from verse 5. Moses said, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Watch this. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of who? In the sight of the peoples, the nations, who will hear all the statutes and say, wow, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Mm -hmm. For what great nation is there that has got so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I said before you this day? What is Moses saying? He's saying, hey, I have given you the laws of God. I have given you statutes. Be sure to keep them. Because this is the only way that the people will be introduced to the true character of God. What a high call. What a high call. So the Israelites were on display from the get-go. God is saying, I want people to look at you and learn who I am. Right? Go with me in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah. We want to uh, uh, consider again here. Zechariah chapter 8. Old Testament book. Zechariah chapter 8. And the context here is in Jerusalem. Now the prophet Zechariah is basically chastising Jerusalem. He says, Jerusalem, you need to get your act in order. And he's got to go a whole long a whole laundry list of the things that will happen once Jerusalem becomes what God meant it to be. Right? And in verse, uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 23, the very last verse, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, in the days when you guys get your stuff together, in those days, ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. The people of God have always been on display. And this theme, that's why I was so excited, this theme of each one, reach one, captures the burden of God. Because through his people, by the world watching his people, they can learn of the awesome love and grace and mercy and righteousness and holiness of God. And that can start correcting all these weird ideas that people have of who God is. Well, the gospel in Jesus is you being on display in front of angels and men living in such an excellent way that when people look into your life, they can get a glimpse, they can get a picture of who God is. That when they look upon you, as they will look at the Mona Lisa, that they will be filled with thoughts of the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the grace of God, 
the mercy of God, the wisdom of God, by looking at the church. Here's the rub. Here's the application. Friends, the way that you and I live our life each day is the best witnessing tool that we can ever have. I mean, not everyone can preach, right? Not everyone can abide by the system laws of political propriety. Not everybody can do that, right? Not everybody can go door knocking. Not everybody can sit down and have a one-on-one Bible study with somebody else. But one thing that all of you are today is alive in Jesus Christ. And God has called you to live in an excellent way. God has called you to live your life as his masterpiece. Showing to the world and to the angels and to men that God is love. That God is a wise God. That God is a righteous God. I was talking to my fiance not too long ago, and we were just uh, just talking about what it means really to be on display. And she introduced me. See, the English language is a very it's a very interesting language. You know, you can coin a phrase anytime you want to, and if enough people subscribe to that thing, that thing will take off. Right? She introduced me to this word to this phrase is called evangel living. <laughs> evangel living. What does that mean? That means your life, that means my life, is the gospel. Yeah. Instead of going somewhere to put on an evangelistic series, yeah. instead of flying to the other side of America to do this, you live the gospel. Amen. So that the people that come in, that interact with you, can have a glimpse of who God is. Amen. I mean, what is the whole point of the gospel, right? Is to paint this awesome picture, this beautiful image of who Christ is. Amen. The matchless charms of Christ. Amen. That is the gospel. Amen. And so Paul is saying to the Corinthians, look. Quit bantering about about those things that don't matter. (laughs) Quit focusing on minors. Quit quarreling, I'm of of, of Paul, I'm of Paul. Paul even said, I'm glad I never baptized any of you. (laughs) Yeah, he said, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. Basically what he's saying is, hey, they are weightier issues on the balance. You are on display... You are a theater. You are God's masterpiece. And the world is watching. So how does that look like? How does that look like to be God's man? How does it look like to be God's woman? I want to call to your your, your memory here really quickly before we close. The story of Job. You all know the story of Job, don't you? Yeah. Alright, so we won't even bother to open that. This is probably one of the best well-known stories of the Bible. What happens? God is in a meeting room, right? They're having this meeting, and the sons of God, obviously the sons of God, show up, right? They come to present themselves in front of God. But I want you to catch this, right? There are three parties there. There's God, there's the sons of God, and who else shows up? Satan. Satan, right? So when you when you read that thing, it's almost as if the presence of Satan was not expected. Right? You know, they're sitting there, you know, God is going through the agenda and he looks up, and dude is late, comes sit in the back, he's like, where did you just come from? Right? And what did he say? From walking up and down, where? In the earth. And what happens immediately after that? God says, have you considered my name, my man, my servant Job? What just happened? What just happened? 
Friends, I want to suggest to you that that is the heat of the great controversy right there. Right? It's like you walk into a room and there's Isaac Newton and there's Aristotle and they're having this abstract philosophical discussion and you're just like, <laughs> you totally missed the point, right? I want you to watch this. What did Satan say he just came from? From walking up and down where? In the earth. What does that mean? It means he's in charge of it. Right? Go with me in the book of Deuteronomy very quickly. Let's go and look at that. Deuteronomy chapter 11. I want you to understand, friends, what is happening here. Yeah, we can say, you know what, well, God was so, just so proud about Job. Yes, he was, but there's something else happening here. Right? God just got challenged. That's what happened. That's what happened. Right? The devil walks into God's house, and he challenges God. He says, I own the earth. Everybody in it, too. So God says, really? You do, huh? Okay, well, let's see if you do Deuteronomy 11, verse 24. Basically, this is what Satan was saying. Every place which the soul of your feet tread shall be yours. From the wilderness in Lebanon, from the river, uh, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea, shall be your territory. Basically, what the devil says, he said, hey, I'm going to use your principle against you. I just came from walking up and down the earth. That means I own every single inch of that place. That is my territory. And because Job was living in such a way that the angels and men were learning from him what the character of God is. And God knew that Job was a trustworthy man. God says, well then, if you considered my servant Job. The question then becomes this. Can God put his honor on you? Can God take off his jacket and hang it on your life and be confident that he won't fall down and be messed up. Can God trust you? Amen. That right there, my friends, was the heat of the battle. When we talk about the great controversy, we are not talking about this weird idea out in the Ethereum somewhere. Right? This is the heat of battle between good and evil. And you and I, my friend, are caught in the middle of it. Right? And what God requires of you and I is that we live our lives in such a way that your life becomes an argument in favor of God. That the way that you live your life, the way that people see you, they will get a glimpse of who God is. The Mona Lisa sitting out in France right? In Louvre Museum, yes. Sitting right there, 6 million people every year. That is over 16,400 people a day. I want to suggest to you today that the masterpiece of God can achieve much higher results than the genius of man. Amen. <laughs> what God has put in the church is his very name. So there it is. Each one, reach one. I want to suggest that each one reach a million. Amen. 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 Yes? Yes. Each one reach a million. I can do that. And you don't have to go to seminary school. No. Amen. All you do is just live in excellence. Thank you. All that title is Right? Show off the character of God in your life. Amen. 
instead of evangelizing, you do what? Evangelism. <laughs> <laughs> that is the whole essence, friends, of the gospel. You are God's masterpiece. You are God's workmanship. Made in the very image of God. And God desires that the principality and the powers in heavenly places can learn of the wisdom of God. God desires that the world can look at you and realize, wow, God is loving you. Yeah. God is God is a I want to be the masterpiece all about you. We are stuck here, friends. We are stuck here. The thing that we can do is so often praise God. The Apostle Paul in Romans 10, he says, how beautiful, right? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who do what? Bring good news, right? And that good news is what? The gospel. The gospel. I want to pray with you. And you, you know, you, you may be thinking that, wow, when I wake up in the morning and I look at myself in the mirror, there is nothing inside of me that is worthy of examining. Wow, I wonder what the angels think about my life. I want to assure you, friend, that there is no need to despair. Because we serve a God who has walked every mile of our existence. And he sympathizes with our experience in this world. All we have to do is say, God, you live inside of me. And you will do it. Friends, it won't be a dream. <laughs> He will do it in your life, and the people and the world will say, Wow, what happened to you? What happened to you? So, Frank, this is very specific. This is very specific right now. I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about your life. Is God honored in your life? He's got a in your life. If you were the one in Job's shoes, would God have won that battle that day? Or he would have lost. So you think you'll be thinking about that. And if you feel the spirit inside of you saying, you know what? I can give you a brand new self. I can give you a brand new start. You don't have to worry about yesterday. You can start fresh today. Amen. You start living for God. If that is your desire, if that is your prayer, I want you to stand. I want you to stand, and I will pray with you. I will pray with you. God's first is that we will be in good Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful message that you have brought to us today. What a privilege. What an honor. What a compliment. That, Father, we get to represent you in front of the whole universe. Angels and men. Weak and feeble though we may be, we know that you have overcome the world for us. That you have given us every possible way to live up to the standard that you called us to. So, Father, our heart's desire today that you may erase the mistakes of our lives 
that you may take away all those things that are not worthy of example in your heart. And Father, that you may keep us a brand new start. That is our heart's desire. And we thank you, Lord, because we know that you delight to come into our lives and live with us and show your grace and your mercy through our lives. Father, for that we say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.